Okay. Hi, everyone. Now I lost my mouse again. Um, so my name is Rachel, and today I'm going to talk to you about JavaScript Display. Um, but before we get into like the programming part and all of the technical details, I'm going to talk to you about why I love games so much. Um, basically, you are supposed to be full screen. Okay. So, um, in 1988, Socrates was a game system that came out by VTech. It was an educational gaming system where it had math games, art games, architecture games, and I just really loved it. Um, it was super cool and ahead of its time. It was wireless. It used an infrared controller that you would put um, the main unit on top of your CRT, and then you would take the like keyboardy one with the mouse, and it would communicate wirelessly through the infrared. And you would just be able to do a lot of different stuff. Um, my favorite was probably the interior design one, um, which is essentially what I use The Sims for, because <laughs> nobody. I'm actually convinced that nobody plays The Sims to like make relationships happen. I think that we just all really like to decorate houses. <laughs> um, but one really awesome thing that I noticed when I started thinking about why I love uh, like indie game design is. Uh, the motto for Socrates was let's learn and play together and I think that is a awesome message in terms of wanting to learn anything. Uh, if you make it fun, if you gamify any kind of learning process, it tends to stick better in my opinion. That's how I learn. As, um, as I started getting older and finding out about independent game dev, I found this game, which is called VVVVVV, and it's by Terry Cavanaugh, and it came out in 2010. And basically, um, you are this little person, and there are all different color-based names, and all it does is alter gravity, and it's so hard, but it's really awesome. And it's like very simple game mechanics and very simple graphics, but it has a lot of depth to it. And I actually have a degree in design. And I was like, I could do the graphics. I don't know if I could program this, but it seems really easy. Uh, and then, let's fast forward. <laughs> uh, I'm from New York, but I moved to the Midwest for a bit. And, um, this make this will make sense in a second. Uh, when I moved back to New York City, I became a part of a indie game space called Baby Castles, which is kind of like a tech incubator, but without tech people. So it's mostly just game development. And I saw Quop, and they actually uh, built a big thing on the floor where you could like actually have to step on stuff to try and control it. And I was like, okay, I found something that I could definitely code myself. And I just felt <laughs> more inspired to make weird stuff. Because I think these kind of things are what really sticks with you versus like looking at somebody that made a Mario hack or something. Um, and I also saw a talk. <laughs> I also saw a talk by someone named Mr. Speaker in October of 2014, and his talk was about how awesome game dev was, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to make a game. And I did, and it was terrible, but I did it. <laughs> All right, so raise your hand if you are a JavaScript dev. Okay, keep your hands up. Don't put them down until I say. And keep your hand up if you play video games. Okay, there's still a lot of people. Keep your hand up if you've ever made a video game. Okay, there's, that's still a pretty good, awesome amount of people. But for you, without your hand up, look around. Hopefully, by the end of this, you if, if you ever see this talk again, your hand will be up. Because I just really want to get people to make their own thing. All right. I would have picked cool, but... We're going to talk about games now uh, from a, a little bit different perspective. Uh, and that's what is a game. It's something that entertains, something that delights. The user controls mostly what happens. Uh, and there's usually something to learn or a goal to achieve. And it exists to entertain, educate, or it can just be art. Um, there's a lot of discussion in the games community of what is a game? Is this story that I click through a game? Yeah, totally. Is this five second experience that somehow manages to tell a story in that short amount of time a game? It totally is. And uh, yeah, 
I don't think that you should be able to let other people define what you make as what they think it is. Now, let's talk about what is an app, since we're all developers and familiar with this. Um, it's something that entertains, mostly, something that delights. The user controls mostly what happens unless you scroll jack. <laughs> There's usually something to learn or a goal to achieve. And it exists to entertain, educate, or it can just be art. Totally just like a game, right? It's, it's awesome. So why don't we take the skills that we use every single day for our job and apply them to games? It's easy. You just don't get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, some benefits of game dev from my perspective are there's no linting, there's no pull requests, <laughs> There's no code reviews. There's no rules. And I hate rules. <laughs> Unless you want them to be. You can totally <laughs> keep things nice and clean. Um, the best thing about games is it doesn't matter what's under the hood since the user's only going to be seeing your top level. Like nobody, other than like the people in this room, you probably view the source on a website a lot. And, but it's a little bit different with games. So it can be as hideous as you want it to be. You can do whatever you want, it doesn't matter. Write your code in Notepad++, use tabs instead of spaces, pronounce GIF with a soft G, because I do. You can indent nothing, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter what you do, because it's about the user journey. Um, it doesn't matter how you write the code, if you open sources or not, nobody's gonna criticize you for it because they care more about the message that you're trying to craft. So, it's time to plan. How are we going to plan the game? Um, so you're, you're all going to be familiar with something that looks like this, probably. You know, like a UX, UI, user flow map. This one is about getting coffee. Um, but you know, you have your start states, and then they branch out into other actions. And game storyboarding is exactly the same. <laughs> I, this is mine. <laughs> Sorry, it's kind of hard to see. Um, I basically just wrote out the sprites and what I wanted them to do, and I drew a map, and I was like, cool, that's my game. It makes sense, I promise. Um, the point is, like, as soon as you have the main concepts of what you want to put into your game, you can break it out into smaller steps, which is, I mean, essentially what a web app is with different functions and modules. So, what are game mechanics? Uh, there's a lot of different things that compromise game mechanics, and they are comprised of movement, mobility, how you control your character, how you move in that environment, especially if it's 2D or 3D, and there's a lot of different things. Rules, so rules would be, can I fly? Can I swim? Can I go through walls? How, how do I score? Uh, do you complete quests? Do you eat candy? Do you make pizzas? Like, whatever your game's about, you have to figure out how the scoring happens. Um, and they're separate from your plot or theme, which tells a story. And then you get to pick which game genre. There are a lot. There's platformers, first-person shooters, adventure games, role-playing games, real-time strategy games, MOBAs, beat-em-ups, shoot-em-ups, fighters, survival games, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot. Um, so, but today, we are going to be specifically making an action platformer, but I'm not calling a platformer. It is a catformer. <laughs> And the library that we're going to be using today is Phaser, but there are a lot of game li libraries to choose from. There's also Pixie, P5, Construct, Crafty, Twine. Twine is all text-based, and it's really easy to use. Um, you don't even know how to need to know how to program to use it, but it's HTML and JavaScript, and it's pretty rad. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. The Mozilla Developer Network has a really awesome list of game engines and tools. That's a link. I know you can't click it sitting there yet. We're not that far into the future, but I'll link to my slides if you want to find it later. All right, Phaser. Phaser is an HTML5 and JavaScript platform that's a 2D game engine supporting web, Android, and iOS platforms. And it's really easy to use. The documentation, not so great, but uh, they have a lot of cool starting points for you to grab that you can look at the source code and adapt it to do pretty much whatever you want.
All right, so now we're going to talk about the setup for Phaser. Um, all of my code slides are going to have actual demos after, so you can see exactly what um, we're changing. Hopefully, it's easy to follow along. If you have any questions, you can ask me later. So everything with Phaser is in line. Uh, well, for this example, it's going to be in line. Just right in the index.html page in a script tag. You can get fancy with it and use require and webpack and I didn't want to do that, so it's going to be fairly simple and straightforward. So in a window onload function, you need to declare the game as a variable which starts phaser. This is after including phaser in the head, um, which you can download the source code from its site. Um, and then we are defining the boundaries. It's going to be 800 by 600 pixels wide. And then we're defining the three functions that it has access to, which is preload for preloading all our graphics, create, which is for creating the objects on the um, like game canvas, and update, which runs at, I think, 60 frames a second. And yeah, and then you write the three functions out. Um, also, if you are going to declare any variables, you're going to want to add them outside of those three functions with the uh, game variable at the top so everything has access to the global scope. All right, so let's talk about sprites, which are the most important part of a game. Otherwise, you would be looking at a black screen. Uh, sprite sheets are what you need for animation. You can't just put an animated GIF in there. Um, they are as many frames as you want of all equal size, and each frame is a different uh, animation, just like if you would look at a, it, it's essentially if you're in Photoshop and you're making an animated GIF, you would see the timeline down at the bottom, and a sprite sheet is the timeline, but instead of everything on top of each other, it's laid out flat. Um, usually, it controls the directions, left, right, up, and down, uh, and physics can be applied to sprite sheets. So. Here's one that we're using for the game. This is my cat, Rick. He's fat, and he likes to be pet. And there's six frames in this animation, three for the left animation and three for the right animation. And each um, chunk is the same width and height. Otherwise, there would be like jittery movement. So we're going to add Rick in to the preload function. You just load the sprite sheet. You give it a name. You link to the source. And then the last three are it's 76 pixels wide by 44 pixels high, and there's five frames because there's six, and it's JavaScript, so you have to start at zero. All right. And then we want to add Rick into the world. So we are also starting the game with the Phaser Physics Arcade. It has a couple different physics engines. Arcade is the simplest one to use. Um, you're setting the world boundaries. Uh, starting at 0, 0, which is x and y, and 800 by 600 pixels. And then you add the player in, and you're saying it's Rick, but when we drop him in, we're taking the height of the game world and minusing 150, so it gets that like dropped in view when you start older NES games. And then we're uh, putting physics on the player, because if we didn't, he wouldn't move. The next thing that we need to do is uh, add a little bit more physics on there and add an animation loop. So let me move my mouse over here so it's easier. This is the step that we did previously. And now we're just adding uh, arcade physics on the player, which is Rick. We're giving him a little bit of bounce and a little bit of gravity and allowing him to collide with the world bounce so he doesn't just fall out of the way. And then we're adding a loop to the animation. And then we're going to play in update since that's the one that runs all the time. And there we go. It's looping through all of the animations, it dropped them in, uh, but we can't control them yet. So we want to do that. We're going to add some variables up at the top that are relating to him looking around. Sorry if they're named kind of weird. I copied and pasted these from the actual game. Uh, and then we want to add a left and a right animation, defining which of those frames are the animation frames. And then an update. Also, game dev is just like a lot of variables and a lot of conditional statements over and over and over and over. 
So we're writing some conditional statements that are defining if he's looking left or right and allowing you to be able to jump. I'm not going to go through all of them, just showing you how easy it is. And now, he can walk. I didn't do this one right, so he can kind of be a magic cat and fly, but that's okay. <laughs> all right. Now we're going to give him something to stand on. Uh, we're adding in the, the hardwood asset for the platform and in the preload function because every image you add in preload first. And then in the create function, we're adding it to a group. We're enabling a body on it, which just gives it like a space. And we are adding it at zero and minus 64 of the total game height. And it's a movable. And then in update, we need to make it so that the player collides with the platform. So Rick can walk around and not, uh, not fall through the floor. Next, we're going to do some collision detection, which is the most important part of a game, I would say, because it, it pretty much is what you use to deal with every kind of situation that you would be in. It sets the world boundaries for the player, where they can walk, what they can go through. It tells you if the player is hit by enemies, by bullets, by anything, by checking for an overlap. It's what helps you land on platforms, and it helps you interact with useful objects if you're doing a quest or something and then not going through walls. So let's give him some treats. And then with the treats in the create function, we are applying the arcade physics to it and collide world bounds, which means it's a collidable object, but we're only going to set the collision on up. So as Rick's moving through, he's going to be able to walk behind the treats, but if he jumps on the treats, he can um, land on the box. And the treat's body are immovable, otherwise when he collides with it, the physics will just send the treats flying in whatever direction he hits. Which is funny the first time and annoying the rest of the times you set it up. And then in update, we set the arcade collide with player and treats. So now, Rick can do his favorite thing in the world, which is get to snacks. But he can also walk through it. So, but now we need to like reward him for that. So, scoring. We're gonna set some new variables for score text, and then we're just gonna create the score text on the screen. You probably can't see this, so let me scroll over. We're adding it at 1616. That's that's it. That's it for adding. If we can get over. Cool. And that just adds it up here. But nothing is happening yet when he walks through. So we need to hook up that scoring function. All right, so now in the update, we're just gonna make this treat score thing that fires whenever there's an overlap between the player and the treats, and we're gonna give them 50 points. We're gonna update the score to say the, the points that we add, and then we're going to kill the treats object and remove it from the play field. So, Rick, are you excited? He can still jump on top and nothing happens, but all right, he ate that whole box. <laughs> and that's really all you need. That's the whole entire base elements of game dev. Congratulations, we're all gonna be rich. Um, <laughs> so there's one other thing that I didn't do in this, but it is in the source code, uh, and that's game states. So if you're gonna have multiple states, uh, like a title screen or different levels, you would need to set those up. Um, that's actually what require is really helpful for if you wanna make a smoother transition, but for the sake of keeping it quiet and easy, we're not gonna talk about those. So you've seen the cat and you've seen the treats, and so now I should probably tell you what we're working on. There's a game called Rick's Big Day, and I'm gonna show it to you right now. All right, I'm ready for audio. So, this is not it. <laughs> this is Rick's big day. I did all the graphics. Um, the music was by my friend Luke, who's in Anamana Gucci. And I programmed the whole thing. So let's play. So basically, you are Rick. 
and this is an action cat former. So he can he can jump on everything. That is a KitchenAid mixer. Um, I know we're in Washington, but I swear it's not a bong. Um, so my favorite types of games are point and click adventure games, and I also love platformers, so I wanted to combine both of those things. So he can actually interact with whatever he wants, but I don't tell you what it is. So he's gonna play with this cat grass and get some points. He, he's gonna drink some water now, do a little dance. The game is still in development. I'm not totally done yet. He can take a nap in that box and it's gonna be an extra level. This is actually exactly what my apartment looks like, by the way. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> Minus the pixel graphics. Uh, he can poop. Um, and since it's his big day, he always has nine lives. They never go down. He just keeps on scoring and playing with things until he's ready to go to sleep. And that's when Rick's big day is over. So yeah, that's the game. Yes. Uh, and now I want to talk to you about some other uh, indie games that I think are pretty cool that you should check out. Uh, this one, I'm this next one, I'm biased on because uh, it is my boyfriend's game. <laughs> he uh, made a really awesome shooter that he wrote in 6502 assembly that's available on actual physical cartridges for the Nintendo. Um, it's starversus.com if you want to check it out. He makes some really cool technical posts too about how he did all the graphics. He made a tool called Make CHR that runs with Node to split out all the images so you can see like reoccurring um, colors because you only have like an eight color palette with Nintendo. I don't know what he does. He's way smarter than me. Um, this is another really awesome game. It's called Slam City Oracles. You're a riot girl group, there's two of you, and you just get to smash stuff, so it's, it's cool. And I actually heard from this game dev that the for, for the first time she loves game dev because it doesn't matter what your code looks like, and I love writing bad code that does fun things, so. And then there's also this Castle Run game by Lindsay Bita, and she makes a bunch of really cool games and is also a dev, and it is built in phaser, and it's like Oregon Trail, but Star Wars. <laughs> All right. So what now? There's game jams that you can compete in uh, all the time. They have different requirements. They're just like hackathons. We all know about hackathons, but it'll make you feel less bad about yourself afterwards. Um, there's Ludum Dare, which is the one that I participated in. It happens a few times a year. There's, a, uh, there's no restrictions on it, except you have to use assets that are free and open to the public or create them yourself. There is TIG Source, which is the indie game source uh, that I'll also tell you about hackathons and fun things to do. Uh, Itch.io is a really, really, really awesome, fantastic site, which is just all about indie games, and people post their games there, and you can check it out and play it. And then if you're interested in game dev, but you don't really know where to start, Zoe Quinn made this site called Sorting Hat, which you can go through, and it tells you about the different tools that you can use. So uh, I want you all to go out and make something. Uh, there's WebGL VR, which is really cool that hopefully I can talk to you about some other time. There's voxels. You can make Minecraft in JavaScript with 3D cubes. Um, there's P5 and 3JS, which have also been used to make games, and it's really, really cool. Just pretty much forget about the constraints that you adhere to every day and try and do something different with stuff. That's all that I ask. So I want you to have fun, break the rules. Games are art, so go make some art. Thanks. You can see my slides on imcool.online slash talk slash Rick's Big Day. And then I also have the GitHub repo, which is what the code looks like now, which is totally different. It's really ugly, and I love it. Uh, and I also commented everything, so you can tell what controls what um, as you're sorting through the hundreds of variables and conditional statements. Thanks. Ooh. Yay. I, I did really good on time, yeah, too. Yeah, you did really well. Right.